Hello everyone, it's me, Matmus. Thank you again for joining me on today's video. Hope you're having a good one. We are discussing firearms manufacturers today, and particularly Heckler and Coke, or Heckler and Coke, as some people like to say. Now, this firearms manufacturer, as many of you know, are world-renowned in producing firearms that are of high-quality standards and very reliable. Not only that, but they have a huge variant of applications for either handguns, rifles, or other different types of weapon systems out there. Even the grenade machine gun, which I have personally used myself. Now, the weapon systems that they produce have been very, very good at what they do, but there has been some controversy recently into what is actually going on with the company overall. Some rumours have stated that they may potentially be going into the red with their money because they just cannot seem to export and import these kind of weapon systems to other countries due to the fact there are so much restrictions with H&K. But today's video we're actually going to talk a little bit about its history and where H&K came from and what they are doing today. So. Rooted in the long tradition of German firearms manufacturer, H&K was founded by three former Maus engineers after World War II. A major contract to provide a rifle for the Federal German Army brought the company pretty good early success, and it has been a significant force in the weapons production ever since. Products such as the G3 and HK33 rifles have sold very widely and spawned numerous variants, making H&K brands one of the most familiar in the world of weapons. In the three years following World War II, Allied forces of the UK, US and others put severe restrictions on industry in Germany, and although some of these curbs were soon lifted, the ban on the arms production remained well into the 1950s. The Mauser weapons factory at Obendorf was shut down by the French occupying forces, but three former Mauser employees, Edmund Heckler, Theodore Koch and Alex Seidel, salvaged some of the machinery. All three were seasoned engineers with experience in firearms manufacture and metalworking industry, and they needed all their skill and adaptability in the tough economic conditions of post-war Germany. Their new business, originally named after Heckler but renamed Heckler & Koch, began as a manufacturer of bicycles, machine tools and precision parts for items such as sewing machines. Many of their workers had formerly been Mauser employees. When Germany began the reconstruction of its economy after the war, there was a large demand for the items originally produced by H&K. But the founders' roots were in the firearms business, and they waited patiently for a chance to return to the industry in which they had once flourished. The opening did not come until the mid-1950s, where the ban on weapons production was finally lifted. But the big opportunity for H&K arrived in 1956, when the tenders were invited to produce a new assault rifle for the infantry of the German Federal Army. The successful weapon was based on a rifle that had been deployed at the old Mauser factory in the 1940s, before being modified by the Spanish design and developed agency of CETME, and then refined still further by H&K. The army preferred their design to competitors on an offer at the time, one rifle from America and another from Switzerland, and in 1959 H&K was awarded a contract to produce the rifle which became known as the infamous G3. The G3 was based on the Roller Delayed Recoil Action, developed by the engineer Ludwig Wurglimmer. The weapon has a modular design, allowing the user to swap parts at speed to reconfigure the rifle. In addition, H&K made the host of variants on the basic design. Versions with different trigger groups, sights, stocks, deflectors and other parts have been widely produced, making the G3 one of the most highly versatile and helping weapon systems you could ever see on the battlefield today, and has become very wisely used between militaries, police forces and many other branches. There are four main groups of these weapon systems, each sharing the G3's roller delayed action, but each chambered for a different cartridge and consisting of a large subfamily of weapons. A prime example is the infamous MP5 submachine gun, which, like the G3, is a modular design so that the user can adapt it with ease, and it has spawned its own many variants. The MP5 has been bought by military and law enforcement customers all over the world, and unfortunately has some mixed reviews around there. The problem is that the MP5 is still quite a dated system, still using the older system of the roller delayed action. There are more highly competitive customers taking on H&K in this kind of configuration and looking at more different subsystems with the M16 or AR15 platform that are starting to take over. H&K has always been a firearms designer that has kind of gone outside the box and gone with some very interesting concept designs of weapon systems, but has also worked very heavily with different materials which were new and unusual for firearms such as polymers. While these materials had been used for non-structural parts such as grips, 
HK, as well as other companies such as Glock, pioneered their use for gun frames, making huge weight savings. And once the precision molds for the parts had been made, savings in manufacturing costs too were given. Polygonal rifling technology was also something that Heckler & Koch had very good expertise in. A lot of people have no idea what that is, but basically look it up. It's where you think that barrels are created round, but they're not. And it's a, a little bit different to traditional rifling, and the engineers that designed it looked outside the box again. And that's really the trend that HK were going for from, from its early days. They're really looking for new and sort of out of the norm technology to, to go for, and that's a really interesting premise. The old idea had fallen out of favour though, but HK applied it to modern weapons, replacing the traditional grooved barrel with a rounded polygonal internal surface to give a better gas seal around the projectile. HK have successfully tethered these technological ideas to the development of versatile families of weapons, making them one of the leading firearms manufacturers of the 21st century. Now there are many new weapons platforms that HK are producing today. Some of the more infamous ones I'm sure you're aware of, HK416, uh, other types of uh, you know AR style platforms that people get very hot and heavy under the collar for. I personally don't have this huge infatuation with HK, but I do like the fact that they have gone that extra mile and looked at different technologies to try and improve firearms and the firearms industry as a whole. You know, a lot of principles and technology that HK developed, many other countries basically stole the principles from. Um, does that mean that, you know, HK has, you know, been the, I guess, the founder of modern firearms technology? Absolutely not. But I think they've paved a very good way for it. And the ideas that they've produced and the kind of technologies that they've run with have really kind of opened a lot of doors for other firearms manufacturers. And that's pretty important. Of course, the era of innovation was where Germany really wanted to work heavily on its machine pistols. By the end of the 1960s, HK released the defining firearm of the MP5 machine pistol, which we saw in the Iranian siege um, for the embassy there with the UK and the SES. And this was a crucial foundational stage for HK, which did not go unnoticed. In the late 1970s, they saw a massive boost in investments for overall growth for this firearms developer. It was at this point that HK expanded their business like crazy over the next two decades. Nonetheless, not even two decades of success could keep them from succumbing to the troubles of the Cold War in Germany. In the end, they lost a contract after contract until 1991, where they were forced to sell Royal Ordnance, a subsidiary of British Aerospace, now BAE Systems. While this period saw some of HK's greatest innovations, including the G36 and the P8, it only lasted about 10 years until it was sold to a group of private investors in Germany. After first separating the company into defense, law enforcement, and sporting firearms divisions, the new HK skyrocketed into the global markets. Besides, for finally reaching the American civilian market, HK also earned several world-class contracts, including one with the US Army and one with the Department of Homeland Security. Currently, HK is one of the largest suppliers of firearms across the globe, so much that it is hard to find a single world conflict without HKs all over the place. While this remains true, the company founded really by ex-Nazi engineers seems to have had grown a conscience, or at least they're trying to pretend to. Towards the end of the summer, the German company announced that they would no longer be marketing weapons to non-NATO EU countries. But if you look a little deeper, HK actually said that they would still sell firearms to what they call green countries. To be a green country, one must either be a NATO member or NATO equivalency country, whatever that means, as well as the score well on the Transparency International Corruption Index and the Economist Intelligence Unit's Democracy Index. Again, whatever they mean. So while they have been accused of several times of trafficking arms to third world countries, they will officially no longer sell weapons to Egypt, Turkey, Israel, Saudi Arabia, or any African nation. While it's still early to determine whether or not their motives are real and genuine, it's definitely going to take a toll on their global revenue. Well, for the most part, that's where they're getting problems, and the global revenue is being hit by their reputation right now due to some of the things that they've been doing. Um, I've actually fired a HK-45 in the P-30SK, and I can personally attest to the quality of their handguns. Um, I've never really been a massive fan of shooting handguns in general, but I do feel that they have some really good handguns um, in terms of military weapons. They're definitely applicable for, you know, military service. Law enforcement is the exact same, you know, the HK-45, the P-30, the SP-5K, the P-2000, the USP. There's a lot of different variants, you know, the SOCOM. 
Uh, very, very good handguns. As I said, I'm not really a handgun user. I'm more of a rifle guy. So, you know, I don't have a huge amount of experience on them, but I can safely say they've earned themselves quite the reputation. You know, once I got a hold of a HK-45 and spent some time with the range, I actually kind of fell in love with it, and I was actually tempted to get one. Unfortunately, handguns in Canada are a little tough for us to, to shoot here unless you, you know, go and get your restricted license and play with it only in the range as a as a kind of a toy, and that's really what they are for the most part, sort of a, you know, a paper puncher, but uh, for me, I, I really enjoyed the handgun. It was a lot of fun. You could tell it worked very well. well. And while HK used their popular USPs as the base for their new forceful handguns, they added several tremendous features to boost the ergonomics and the overall handling of the handguns. You can definitely feel it when you, you know, you, you use those handguns. They're a lot of fun. And when I first shot it, I legitimately was quite shocked at how well it was to control. There was no massive recoil. It was comfortable. Ergonomically, it was very nice. Uh, for a 45, that's that's sometimes quite hard to find. You know, I like my Colt 1911s. A lot of fun in the 45, but... Uh, yeah, they, they definitely have a little bit of an edge to them with the, uh, you know, the, the H&K handguns. They're just a lot of fun. Now, in terms of more modern firearms that they've produced, although the majority of H&K's long arms are shipped to federal law enforcement agencies and global militaries, they do market a few civilian options. HK has earned the reputation for excellence and innovation in a large part due to their revolutionary HK416. With the hopes of replacing the M4 and the M16 as the next rifle for global militaries, the German firearms manufacturer utilized their reliable proprietary gas piston system for this rifle. Plus, with their free-floating four-quadrant rail system surrounding their cold hammer forged barrel, there are some seriously remarkable and sexy features about the HK416. Personally, though, I'm not a huge fan. You know, it's a great rifle, 100%. It's used around the world, especially by special forces, including the SAS. You know, they've used the MP5. Now they've upgraded the uh, the HK416. But, you know, it's if you're going to use it just as a civilian, you're paying way too much money for something that, for the most part here in Canada, you're going to be using to shoot a paper. One of the more interesting firearms that I've always enjoyed is the HK G36. There's also the HK SL8, which is the civilian variant that I'm looking at getting. Um, but uh, it's very, very nice rifle. The G36 was known to be one of the most modular rifles in the world when it first came out. Furthermore, the German assault weapon has the reputation of being very user-friendly, lightweight, and extremely low maintenance. Unfortunately, after serving with the German military for nearly 20 years, the G36 looked like it had seen its time to shine come to an end. In fact, after many studies were released indicating that the rifle was actually extremely inaccurate during prolonged firefights, the German Defense Ministry halted new orders of the firearm. Since then, the G36 has had a huge fan base, though. These results sent shockwaves across the globe and is still being used today. While Berlin confirmed that the G36 pencil barrel produced inaccurate shots in hot environments with rapid fire, H&K was steadfast in their denial of these claims, whereas the relationship with the German government and their top arms producer was actually quite unbreakable, the two parties have since battled it out and there have been quite some severe lawsuits between the two. At the end of the day, the German courts ruled that HK did not owe the government any compensation, though, for the fault on the G36s. It's interesting, though, when you find to hear these sort of things, that uh, you just don't expect it from such a high-class and high-quality manufacturer of firearms. If the G36 still appeals to you, though, if you want to kind of look into getting your own civilian variant and stuff, there is the HK243 SSAR civilian variant, um, which the uh, Bundeswehr uses their service rifle. Assuming that this model doesn't uh, suffer the same issues as the military equivalent, the SAR is actually a really nice sporting rifle and boasts some rather interesting capabilities. One of the most underrated rifles from what I've been told is the MR556A1. Very accurate, completely modular and reliable in terms of performance, and is able to perform from very, very good range um, on paper and at uh, military application. So, lots of products out there for you to look at if you have any interest in actually buying one of these rifles. But in the general terms of things, Heckler & Koch have had some pretty tough times, and most experts agree that the future still looks quite bright, though, for the German arms developer. While they are constantly looking to improve on their already impressive line of weapons and military technology, HK has funneled millions of dollars into expanding their factories. For example, the now international company opened up a new facility as of recent uh, and is still looking at revamping several of their more older facilities with state-of-the-art machinery. So there you have it folks, H&K, some pretty interesting firearms designs in general. 
I personally have never really fired many of the uh, weapon systems that they're talking about today. I wish I could have. I have tried an MP5 before. It was a lot of fun. Really not my style, though. I'm not really into the submachine gun world, especially 9mm. But I would love to have a go of the G3. One day I'm even thinking about getting the uh, G36, which is the... Uh, more modernized assault rifle sort of uh, civilian platform that I can purchase here in Canada. They're expensive rifles, but they look like a lot of fun, and I actually would be really interested to see how it performs compared to, you know, my old bullpup design of the L85A2 and uh, the beautiful C7A2 that we use here in Canada as our service rifle. So maybe one day you'll take uh, a look at the rifle with me in the future and we'll see if it is uh, as good as HK say they are. Um, I hope you enjoyed today's video, folks. If you did, please leave me a like and a comment. Um, if you do want to support my channel, you can go check out my Patreon account. Every type of link and description is all in the box below, so just go scroll down a little bit, take a look in there. There's all sorts of different things, including my Facebook, Discord, uh, fan mail page, all that sort of stuff. So go check it out. Um, and if you do want to be notified of any upcoming videos in the future, I encourage you to click that little bell by the subscribe button so you can be notified of when new videos are actually being released from the channel. Thank you again so much for watching, and if you do have any experiences of using h and I'd love to hear about them in the comment section below. All the best, everyone. Bye-bye.